The disciples have learned of Jesus' plan. They're agitated. What will they ever do without him? And he says, be not troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. Now you see, we must not make the mistake that his disciples there were making and that the world is and has been making up to this moment. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe in me. Now if you take that to mean believe in Jesus, you're going to have difficulties. Jesus was not Jesus. And that's the point. If you're seeing a three-dimensional man, what good is believing in him? He's not sitting in this room with you. He didn't come to Bobby Kennedy. He won't be coming to any one individual who wants him to. Because that isn't what was meant by that phrase. And this is what you've got to get out of your system. The belief that he was telling them to believe in Jesus. He was telling them to believe in the Word made flesh. Jesus already was the Word made flesh. And the Word made flesh is not Jesus, it is the Christ. It is the Christ of God. And the Christ of God is saying to the disciples, believe on me. The Christ of God is saying, let not your heart be troubled. I am the invisible spirit. No one's going to crucify me. And this fellow up front called Jesus is letting me do the work. That's why he's so brave. That's why he's so intelligent. He's letting me within him, the Christ, do the work. And now I'm telling you disciples, don't be concerned because Jesus is going up there to be crucified. Because me within him, the Father within, the Christ within, the Word... is going to take care of the situation. But more than that, learn that I, the word within, which takes care of this particular condition for Jesus, I'm prepared to take care of it for you. That's why I'm training you as disciples. I, in Jesus, am training disciples. Jesus is the front man. The inner self, the Word, the Christ, the creative principle of God is doing the work, doing the training. And of course, that's all the disciples could hear was the man speaking. But let's not you and I hear just the man speaking. Let us take him on his own terms. I of mine own self do nothing. The Father within he doeth the works. And that means the Father who is doing the works is also teaching the disciples. The Father within is taking the disciples and take step by step showing them that there is no power in man over the power of spirit within man. And that when this power of spirit within man is realized by the outer man, he can walk through situations which to a mere human being are impossible. He can fulfill the will of God on earth. He can live under direct guidance of God. He can do the impossible. He can go through death and not die. Because I, the Father within, am life, and I am with him. If he makes his bed in hell, lo, I am with him. 
because he is dwelling in me he is abiding in me and so he walks under the protection of me God within now this is the teaching to the disciples at that time at that day ye shall know says Jesus at that day now you don't know but at that day ye shall know that I am in my father and uh, ye in me and I in you this speaking saying this this riddle is telling his disciples that he is in God God is in him and then he says to the disciples I am also in you now Jesus was not in his disciples but he's saying I am in you and he's telling you his identity right there this I that am in you is Christ I am Christ you think I'm Jesus but I was Jesus until I became Christed and now Jesus and Christ within are one and the same one is the outer one is the inner and this inner this Christ within me is in you and one day ye shall know that and the Christ that is in you which is also in me is in the Father and so because I know that the Christ is in me which is in the Father the Father, the Christ and me are one and when you my disciples know that the Christ is within you which is in the Father you will be one and you will walk in my footsteps he said someday you'll know that well they eventually got to know it but what about you and me why shouldn't we now get to know it that the Christ of Jesus you know you could have been Peter you could have been John you could have been any of the disciples and he would be speaking to you are we not disciples is he not speaking to us was he limiting it to the eleven or the twelve or did he not say if you continue in my word you are my disciples so be there with him or let him be here with you and hear him say someday you will know that the father is in me and I am in the father and I am in you and so please don't accept me as Jesus accept me as the spirit of God realized and the father is in that spirit and that spirit is in the father and that spirit is in you and therefore when you realize it you are in the Father and the Father is in you and that is Christ consciousness that is peace that is security that is awareness of the word of God in you now look at that word for a minute and see what it does see it on a tree coming up through the tree and here's a twig and the word, the sap, the life comes through that twig. Here are flowers. What happens when the word of God comes through you? A barren twig has flowers. What about a barren man or a barren woman? This word is peace. This word is security. This word is abundance. This word is life expressing itself as things your father knoweth you have need of these things it is good pleasure to give you these things seek ye first the word the kingdom of God within you and these things will be added unto you this word you see isn't a word like you speak with your mouth this word is the essence called life and as you're conscious of it it comes up through your being like the sap through a twig and suddenly it sparkles with new life new blossoms new berries and we sparkle with new treasures of God 
Without it, we're barren. With it, we walk in the kingdom of God on earth. This is the living word of the living God. Let's go to John. Look how he starts his gospel. In the beginning was the word. Jesus was demonstrating that there was such a word. In the beginning it was. And the word was with God and the word was God. And that word you see coming to life in Jesus took him through crucifixion and back into resurrection. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by this word. You see, coming from God as source, this word becomes what we call creation. And without him, without this word, was not anything made that was made. It's not just a little word, is it? It's the father of creation. You see, the word is the divine principle of God, the basic concept, the idea, the divine idea, the expression of that idea, the nurturing and maintenance of that idea and the substance of that idea and the law of that idea and the activity of that idea. All of this is the word. God being infinite, the word is infinite. When you try to say this is the word, the word is life or the word is love or the word is beauty, you're missing the infinity of that word. All of infinity is the word of God. And it reveals itself in infinite ways through the consciousness that accepts it. You know, there's a secret about opening your consciousness to the Word. It's a beautiful little secret. You must express a need for it. Suppose, for example, you say right now, I need truth. Well, in that expression that I need truth, you have opened your consciousness to the need. And that's the secret of the word. It responds to your need. The moment you have expressed the desire, the need for truth, truth responds. Truth moves through the invisible into your consciousness and says, hello, here I am. You called for me, didn't you? You must express the need. Where does the Bible say that? That's what it means when it says to you, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's precisely what it means. If you're poor in spirit, you have a need for spirit. What is spirit? The word. Spirit becomes flesh. And if you will reach in for spirit, for word, for truth, it will respond to you. Now, Joel Goldsmith gave us a secret of how to find the word. He said the word is consciousness. Generations after generations are just walking blindly by this brilliant revelation of John. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God and with God. And Joel comes along and tells you how to get that word to move up through your being, like the sap in a tree. Consciousness. If you're not conscious of it, it's just a dead seed lying on a table. But your consciousness says, take the seed and put it in the ground. Your consciousness says, hit the keys of the piano or there won't be any music coming out of it. There's music in it, but it's all potential. Nothing happens unless you're conscious that the music is there. An animal wouldn't walk over, a dog wouldn't walk over to the piano and hit the keys. It isn't conscious that there's music in there. And man is like that animal standing around a piano, unconscious of the word within him, which is music. The infinite keyboard of the Father. Instead of 86 keys, infinite keys. You're to learn how to play that keyboard. Every key is a different quality of God and they are infinite. You can go right down the complete keyboard and it's all there waiting and it's called the word. Here it is, love, companionship, happiness, 
eternality, immortality, truth, beauty, harmony, supply, wisdom, every quality that we wish to find in our human lives is in the keyboard called the word. Who's going to play it? Only the one who's conscious that it's there. Jesus had to give his own life to show us that it's there. There was something there that he depended on that could bring him back and it did. So you know it's there. And he called it the word. And John says in the beginning was the word, even before Jesus. And it will remain. And that word was a light shining in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. Now along comes John the Baptist. He doesn't understand that word either. But he's a cross between the ignorant man and the enlightened. He's in between. He's what you might call the illuminated natural man. He knows more than just the plain ordinary natural man who doesn't know about the light, but he only knows it in his mind, intellectually. He knows enough, though, that there's going to be one after him who is the light realized. He himself can't be that one, but he's the forerunner. He's here to make the announcement that following me will come the one who is that word made flesh. Follow him. He knows what he's doing. And then when Jesus did come, we didn't follow him. We didn't know what he was doing. We thought he was marvelous. We loved all his miracles. But he never performed a miracle in his entire life. Every miracle was performed by the word within him. And that same word within him is the word that said to us, if you believe on me, the word within Jesus, these are the works that you will do too. And greater works because the word within you will do them. Now then, as you express a need for wisdom, for love, for companionship, for truth, something in you begins to come into play. And as you look within, this word will enter your consciousness. And your consciousness, imbued with the word, becomes the law of harmony of your life. You see, only the word is truth, the word of God. And the word of God isn't what you read here. The word of God must come from in there, from within you, within your consciousness. You can look at the word with your eyes and never see it. You can hear it with your ears and never hear it. It must come from within your own consciousness. That word is God expressing. And God expressing as the word through you becomes the guiding principle of your life. Then you see you've got a, an anchor. You can't go to the wrong place or do the wrong thing. The word within you does the work. And that word within you becomes the guiding light of your being. It is God-guided, and it guides you accordingly. Without that word, we have completely missed the Christian message. And you know that the world has missed it. The world has been kept in bondage. That's why so many of our young folks today are completely disinterested in the Bible. It's just a fairy tale to them. And it's really a fairy tale to their elders too. You go to a college and talk to the young folks there and you'll find that they're very sophisticated about life, about politics, about sex, about science. Bible, throw it away. What good is it? Who wants to know about a silly old thing like that? And yet, you see, the only truth they'll ever know has got to come from the Word of God within them. And they've never been taught that. They just don't know it. 
And as a result, not having the word of God within them, well, they go into all kinds of things to find fulfillment. And this leads to a prodigal life. When you're not obeying the word of God, it's the same thing as disobeying it. And so most of us spend our lives in disobedience to the word of God within us. But we're not even aware in our ignorance of that presence of the word within that it's there. And so our complete life is a violation of our own being because that word within us is our own life. That's how our life spins out. And if it doesn't spin out from within, it doesn't spin at all. So finally we reach a dead end here or a dead end there or a detour here and we're always at odds ends to figure out where do I go? What do I do? How do I know? Who's going to tell me? We forget that fellow who walked up on a cross. He was telling us the only important message in the last 2,000 years. That if you find this fellow within you, this divinity of your own being, you are then a son of God. That's the meaning of sonship, obedience to this word. And there is no such thing as a son of God who is subject to any power on the face of the earth for all power is in God the power of God walks back into a form the power of God banishes death the power of God banishes disease when the power of God is released in you can you be sick can you have problems can you have fears what can happen to one who has the power of God released in him? He can experience the love of God, that's all. And the perfection of God's life in him. Do you know that the entire universe is ahead of you, not behind you? We haven't scratched the surface. When you think of the human love we know, this little thimble, and this little thimble of abundance, and this little thimble of happiness or peace and think of what's ahead and think that it's present as well as ahead and it's been present every minute of our lives the fullness of the Godhead bodily is in the word of God within each of us and we can draw out of it the infinity of love supply and abundance and peace and happiness and whatever is in God We have to practice living in obedience to it. And when Jesus said, I'm going to lay down my life to pick it up again, he was practicing obedience to it. Now, you may be sure the word isn't going to say to you, go out and get crucified. It hasn't said it to anyone else. And the only time it would ever say it to you, incidentally, is when you're ready to walk back in. It will never give you a task that cannot be fulfilled because the secret is that when it gives you a task, it fulfills it itself. There is nothing you cannot do that the word of God within you tells you to do. Because before you lift a finger, that word is finished and done. And that act is already completed in the invisible you out here will just be going through the motions of doing what is already done and you'll feel very proud of yourself. But spirit will have done it. Now, this is to clarify why we do not get into funeral processions and cry our eyes out. And why we don't fear for our loved ones. Our fears and our doubts and our confusions and our worries about tomorrow are all based on our separation from the word of God in ourself. It's like a man complaining, I never hear the piano played anymore, and there it is right in front of him, but it doesn't go over and hit the keys. If you want peace, if you want love, it's in the word of God within you. God has said it, 
in no uncertain terms, Son, all that I have is thine. And where? The kingdom of God is within you. That word within you contains all that I have. And if you want to continue in another thousand years of ignorance without it, you have the freedom to do so. The twig on the branch, it must accept the sap that comes up through it. It can't say no. Man was given freedom. He could turn away from God if he wished. And he does. But he can't turn away forever because God's word does not return void. It's just a matter of time until the word within us is so alluring to us until we feel the treasure of it more than we feel the treasures of what we see with our eyes and touch with our fingers. And occasionally we have to stumble just a few more times before we see the futility of a life that is not lived from inner direction. We are all going to come to that point, you see. That was brought out in the Revelation of St. John. In the very first chapter. Let's touch it again. And that's the meaning here. Behold, he cometh with clouds. You see, this is that word, that Christ within you. That illumination, that awakening. That's how they express it. He cometh with clouds. And every eye shall see him. In other words, you will receive this inner dispensation. Just as Jesus did in later Peter and Paul. And even those which pierced him. those who put their sword into the body those who turned away from the Christ of their own being pierced him even they will receive him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him no matter who we are we will all wail in other words we will give up our human beliefs to accept this in a dispensation when the word of spirit appears it later appears in the flesh when the soldiers pierced the body of Jesus on the cross so that the water and blood could spurt that was a physical appearance which had been predicted back in the Old Testament whatever comes as the word through a prophet appears in the flesh when you read these words they are spirit and spirit later will appear as your life you may be sure that each knee will bend as predicted here now those of us who know this aren't waiting for the predictions to come true of their own accord if you're not living by the word of God you have not profited by the experience of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus which Christianity has turned its back on. You have lost it because the world has lost it. But it has been rediscovered. It was rediscovered by mystics, by Mary Baker Eddy, by the film wars, by Goldsmith, by some of the great Hindu mystics, but the point is that truth never dies and the same truth that never dies has ever been in your being waiting for your recognition as you begin to play this invisible keyboard and see the fruits of it <coughs> you see the great service that was really performed when Jesus mounted the cross to save us from our sins is hardly the way to say it. What he did was open the way to the experience of God on earth. 
I don't know if any of us would be prepared to do the same today or if it matters. But if you have problems, for example, you see, if you interpret his act, his action into your problem, then that's what you must learn to walk through too. You must take a problem which appears to you as tragic as death would have appeared to a normal man and just as he could walk through a crucifixion knowing he'd come out alive you've got to learn to walk through a problem knowing that it's as much an illusion as death was to him and you must admit that the illusion of death to him was a far greater thing to overcome than the illusion of a human problem to us but it's the same principle. There stands the problem. The world says it's a problem. The judgment of the world says you've got a problem. But the word within you says, who said so? I am the power. I in the midst of the almighty. I am greater than any problem on the face of the earth. Turn it over to me. Let me handle the problem. And you say, how can I turn it over to this within me if I'm not connected to it within me? And that's your only problem. If you're connected to it, then all the problems of the world are already overcome because when Jesus said, I have overcome this world, it wasn't Jesus saying it. It was the word of God in you saying it. And the word of God in you has overcome this world and all its problems. But you've got to let the word come through. And that's what Browning said about releasing the imprisoned splendor. To release it means to let the word of God come into your consciousness. There's the word. To consciously know that God's power is in me is to enable me to look at that problem and say, now that I am conscious of God within me, I can relax knowing that God is doing God's job. The truth in consciousness is the Messiah. That's all the Messiah ever was. Truth, the word of God entertained in consciousness, freed Jesus from every claim. And that's the real Messiah. And that Messiah is in each of us. The truth that you entertain in consciousness is the Savior, the Messiah, the power of God on earth in you. And over any problem that may appear, no matter what the problem, if you're connected to the Word of God in you, not in a book, but in your consciousness, you will discover that the power of God shines forth and releases you from that which seemed to be the power of a problem. That means every problem. There is no problem that is a problem to the power of God in you. It wouldn't matter if your problem seemed insurmountable to a human mind. When Jesus showed what that word did, he also showed that that word was light and that the light of that word could cure a blind man. He showed that the word was bread and that it could feed multitudes. The judgment of the world said, how can you feed them? There's no food. Well, the word of God will feed them. It'll multiply loaves and fishes. There's nothing in the word of God that is limited. Of course, to a human mind it's limited, but this isn't a human mind. This is the infinite mind of God, and I am one with it. I'm simply going to know the truth, and the truth will make me free. And this is what he kept doing. He knew the truth, and the truth made him free. And he taught it. And those who were able to accept it found if they knew the truth, the truth made them free. And some of us who have learned a measure of this find that if we know the truth, the truth makes us free. And if somebody hates us, we know the truth about them. We know that the word of God in me is love. But the word of God is in that fellow who hates me. What do I care if he doesn't know it? I know it. God is in him just as God is in me. 
And so I release the love that's in me, but it's the same God in him that's in me, and that releases the love in him. Is he sick? Well, what of it? He just is disconnected from the word of God in him. God is health, the health of your countenance. So you're separated from the word of your father within, and of course you're separated from health. Get connected. And if you don't, you go to a practitioner who knows, and that practitioner, living in the consciousness that the word of God within him and within you is the same word, releases it in you, and it becomes the health of your countenance. You see, we have the miracle of the word of God present, and we've all overlooked it. Republicans have overlooked it, and Democrats have overlooked it, and socialists have overlooked it, and white men have overlooked it, and black men have overlooked it. Nations have overlooked it. Churches have overlooked it. Educators and scientists, professional men, mothers, fathers, and it is here. It says, open out a way and release me into your life and watch the miracle of God in you. Now, Jesus didn't speak about it and stop. He wasn't a preacher, as we know preachers. He practiced what he preached. He said, if I'm going to talk about this truth, I'm going to demonstrate it. And we must demonstrate these things, not just talk about them. I would no more dream of getting up here and talking to you about these things if I didn't feel I could go out and learn how to demonstrate them. And you can put me to the test anytime you want to. You can put yourself to the test because the word of God that was in Jesus is in you as it is in me, as it was in Joel Goldsmith and Mary Baker Eddy and Ramakrishna and go down the line of the greats. It was only the Christ in them, the word of God in them, that enabled them to be the great spiritual leaders and demonstrators. And their very teaching is just that. Go forth and do likewise. Follow me. So then, Bobby Kennedy did not die. Nor did Jack, nor did Abe Lincoln, nor did Martin Luther King, nor did your mother or your father or your children. There is a separation from the word of God. And that separation constitutes an unreceptivity to life itself and the disappearance from what we call life is the evidence of that separation from life and that individual returns to pursue again the very same quest he missed the first or second or third time you and I sitting here today have done this thousands of times we have all died thousands of times but we're still here we haven't died and we may die another thousands of times and we'll still be here until we find that word. And then, instead of Jesus being the first begotten from the dead, we too will be begotten from the dead. We will walk in our natural habitat, the garden of Eden, the promised land, the truth on earth. We will walk in spirit, in a spiritual universe, guided only by the inner voice of God. Now, nobody denies this. Nobody even doubts it. Once they begin to hear that voice, once they begin to feel the power of the presence, once that word expresses in you, you are chosen. And your time has come. And now you're ready. You're a pilgrim. You're walking on the path of God. And you're going to find that this word lifts you into every mansion that the Father has. Those mansions, you see, that's the keyboard. That's the infinite keyboard of God. Each mansion is a new form of love and trust and confidence, strength. It goes on and on and on and on. It's all ahead of us. Many of us have already served our apprenticeship. We're ready to be taken into the firm. 
And so when people mourn about Bobby to you, if you must say, yes, yes, I feel the same way you do, it's a pity, isn't it? But within your heart, know the truth. Don't deny his teaching. There is no death. There is only the life, and that life is eternal, and it is yours, and we'll be seeing each other from now on forever. Now then, we've established several things so far in these two weeks. One is that the purpose of Jesus' mission on earth was to establish spiritual law so that you would know the law and not break it. If you turn away from law and break it, you become outside of the law and you're not under the protection of God. You become one of the multitudes who say there is no God or where is God? Why doesn't he show himself? But if you do not break spiritual law, you are under the protection of the law as demonstrated by Paul, who was completely oblivious to his personal self, as demonstrated by any spiritual healing. You break the law of manna, and the law of truth takes its place, and that person is healed. Now then, spiritual law is the purpose of this Bible. We're to learn how not to break this law by learning it. But the safest way not to break the law is to turn to the law maker, which is God, which is the kingdom of God within you, which is the word which was in the beginning. The communication from God to you, that word within you, knows the law because it made the law. And when you rest in this word within you, you must fulfill the law. You can't break it. And so you're never outside the law and you can say, thy grace is my sufficiency. In all things, infection, disease, death, whatever, I'm in the law of God and that is eternal life. That is perfection in all things. And so, so far what we've established is to learn the spiritual law, to learn that humanhood is breaking it every day because it's not connected to the word of God within. You learn to get connected and then you're fulfilling the law. And you will look at the assassins, and you will look at the germs, and you will look at all the lacks and limitations, and you will smile, and you will say, Pilate, you have no power over me. Because me is the word of God, living right here in the flesh. This is the message someday we're going to see spoken from every pulpit in the world. And when it is, then the great energies that we all have perverted by tasks not fitting for the children of God, these energies will be massed into a great renaissance of the divinity of man on earth. In our time, through your efforts and mine, could we be silent for a moment? Maybe you'd like to try something. It will, if some of you respond to it, it can be a very unusual experience. If you can bring yourself to feel this, you will have understood the way Jesus felt. I, and this is you speaking within yourself, I am the Spirit of God on earth. That is my name. I walk in the Spirit of God as the Spirit of God. I am free. 
I'm not concerned about the happenings of a human world, for they are the outer effects. I know if I live as the inner spirit of God, the outer effects will take care of themselves. And this is my inner acknowledgement of my own being. You rush up to me with a problem, but you're speaking to the spirit of God and I don't recognize your problem. And somehow this non-recognition of your problem is my loyalty to the truth of God's presence which says in God's presence there are no problems only fulfillment can you catch the feeling that was in Jesus about I am the living spirit of God on earth follow me not a man follow the living spirit of God on earth and where would you follow it if it's within yourself turn to it and yield to it that's following it and then let the spirit of God that you are lead the outer man and you have caught the significance of the word which still is the light unperceived by the darkness of the mortal mind when you get that feeling you know that you have caught what through the ages man has missed I am the living spirit of God. The best authority in the world said so. My father. And your father. To live that way is to be one with the word. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.